Welcome, Hunter. I didn't know you were a millennial. I knew you were a hero, but I didn't know you were a millennial. I think it just happened in the year 2000. Uh, well, it's good. Hunter, um, uh, I'm, I'm really privileged to call a, a, a colleague and dear friend. I, I had the privilege of contributing to one of Hunter's 13 books, uh, but her natural capitalism was certainly part of my uh, re-education post Wall Street and really one of the important pieces of contribution to the wrestling with the poly crisis that we're now challenging with, uh, challenged with. Um, today's dialogue, we, we want to focus on um, governance. Um, I, 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 I like to refer to the COP process, the, the, um, uh, the UN's climate management process as the single largest and most consequential failure of human governance in the history of our species. Um, and But before we get to that, Hunter is running around New York City this week, part of Climate Week, but also um, uh, right before that was the UN Summit of the Future, which was set up to address essentially the failure of the SDG process. And um, Hunter is much more engaged in these, um, what shall I call them, Hunter? Th these, these- uh, uh, Fool's errands. <laughs> the, the running around to big conferences and big meetings than, than I tend to do um, by, by far. But I, I thought we'd first just check in on what's happening in climate week week and what happened at some of the future since you've been participating is there start with a start with some good news share with us some some good news from the summit of the future it happened and it they put forth a draft of a pact for the future the the whole idea of the summit of the future this is uh, antonio guterres's last ditch effort to save the concept of multilateralism of the world's governments coming together to solve problems, working together, wrestling over what are the big challenges facing humanity, and then putting in place commitments to do something about it. And the, the first draft of the pact was, frankly, not bad. Uh, <laughs> imagine that. The some of the nations that are economically dependent on fossil are opposed to the ability of an international body to tell them anything that they should do or not do, tried to derail the whole process, tried to amend the pact, and in the end, it emerged relatively unscathed, which I mean, yay, if you believe that UN verbiage matters, and there are times, I, mean, I used to be a lawyer, <clears throat> words should matter, governmental institutions coming together and framing regulation should work, and generally it doesn't. So I want to believe that something good will come out of this. On the other hand, things like <laughs> we are absolutely in a climate crisis. The Amazon is burning. I uh, was with uh, some people from the Brazilian NGO. Ima hey, I asked you to talk about the good news. Yes. <laughs> and the Amazon is burning. It's going to turn to Savannah. I was with Sir David King yesterday, the great uh, UK scientist, and he gave a figure that, that really staggered me. 30 million tons of ice an hour are falling off the Greenland ice sheet. When they started measuring it a decade or so ago, it was 10 million tons a year. And what Sir David said was, uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons this matters is at this rate, Sea level rise we're looking at is seven feet. So sorry, those of you in Florida, but the Mekong Delta provides the third, what they're the third largest rice grower in the world. It floods already at least once a year. It's going to 
pretty much be constantly flooded. You salt the rice paddies, you stop producing rice. China, the number one rice producer in the world, most of the- Just going back to the, to, to the iceberg. Shanghai. Just going back to the ice for a second. Do, do they have an estimate on the, the, pay, the rate? Uh, it's accelerating. The, yeah, but is 30, is, is 30 tons of ice seven <clears> feet <throat> in, in our lifetime now also? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Turn of uh, turn of the century. Uh, excuse me. Uh, by 2050. And of course, so all of these projections are if the the behavior we're doing now keeps going. And it doesn't have to. So the most hopeful thing that happened to me here was I was in an extraordinarily frustrating meeting with a with, with a senior uh, multilateral official who was essentially denying that there are, that the climate solutions that we know exist should be implemented. And I walked out into a table of four women from various financial institutions. One of them knew me and said, Hunter, sit down. I'm like, sure, huh, happy to. And the conversation went immediately to a very high level of knowledge about what's going on with the climate, what the climate solutions are, the business case for implementing them, and what they are doing in their own institutions to do this, how they are funding various solutions. And you hear a lot about the pushback against ESG, environment, social, good governance, that the banks are pulling out, that the corporates are pulling out. Here were four dedicated women inside the belly of the beast doing the right thing, knowing what the right thing is, and committed to keeping this work going. I left that meeting feeling very encouraged. What what were their roles? I, I don't know if you can say which institutions, but I'm curious, were they business leader types or sustainability types? Both. Uh, in CFO office, and agreed, this stuff needs to be in the CEO's office, in the CFO's office. One is very senior management at uh, at a big fund. Uh, one was a sustainability officer, but said that she has access to the all of the C-suite, and they're listening. Now, they're listening quietly. What we are seeing is what's called green hushing. Companies are continuing to do the right thing. They're just not talking as much about it because then they don't attract the trolls. But yeah. they're doing it. And this was what these gals were saying. They are doing it because it makes them, saves them money. It's just better business. No polar bears required. Yeah, you and I have had this, I'll call it a conversation, maybe debate many, many times. I... um I remain way more skeptical about the business leaders, business leading us. And, and maybe this is a... Well, here's a good reason not because, why. It's not because business people are bad people. It's because they're trapped in the system that we need to change. And um, I read a, a Bloomberg article someone sent me about um, a woman at, I think it was at Goldman Sachs, using the language of, um, you know, we need to be realistic. And and as soon as I hear someone saying we need to be realistic, I know the game is over. The game is is lost. And um, I think one of the things that we've allowed ourselves to do is is pretend that business can actually lead us to do things that are against our short term interest. I mean, the the entire finance algorithm is designed to keep business profits growing. And um, and while you've pointed out relentlessly and consistently for decades, there's many things that need to be done that can be done profitably. There's also many things that absolutely must be done that are not only not profitable, but, but de deadly to business interests, like stop producing fossil fuels, um, just for starters. And somehow we we've allowed our kind of desire for business governance to lead us to confuse ourselves that we need actually 
uh, you know, call it government governance, which is a very different thing to restrain us. Um, and and our, our government, our government in this country has has been set up, um, you know, the US Constitution was set up to protect private interests. And so we've used that framework to allow free speech to be, you know, corporations have free speech. And so our political process is corrupted. And, and so we're really in a, um, you know, we, we, we don't have the ability to have our government leaders tell us we can't do things um, because it, because they're, they're trapped in a system of dependency on those same interests. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if you agree with that. Um, it, it seems to me both are true. Business can do things that are profitable, that are necessary to do. And we need a way to restrain business from doing things that are in their short-term interests, but in our collective long-term uh, disaster. Sure. And one of the interesting things that's happening now is various jurisdictions that either are more threatened or are what more enlightened are putting in place the kind of regulations that are going to force companies to grapple with exactly these issues. CSRD in Europe, the EU has that now as a mandate. I was in a meeting this morning with uh, senior people from, of all things, the beauty industry who, and, and we were talking to them about exactly this issue of short-term versus long-term thinking and the business case for behaving more responsibly to people and planet, an approach we call the integrated bottom line. If I can show you that being responsible sure. is just better business, then you bake it into your business. And there are 13 reasons why, and at least 13 reasons, and you know, no polar bears required. Um, and they said, no right, and all we have time to do right now is comply with CSRD. Yeah. To which the answer is, if you had been having these conversations all along, you would already have your CSRD compliance. The uh, yeah. sustainable development reporting requirements, what's called double materiality. And so then we got on to a, a more interesting conversation about how do you count all of this within a company? So if you use energy Actually, before, before we move on to that, Hunter, just just on double materiality, um, you're, I know, I'm sure you're familiar with um, Bill Bowie uh, and R3.0's work around this subject. But just for everyone's sake, the the idea uh, we're not in the weeds of this that the the concept of double materiality refers to the idea that um, we need to measure the uh well let me start with single materiality the 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 wrong direction that the whole esg conversation got off on in the first place was to defend esg these environmental social and governance metrics as uh risks that companies need to factor in in order to do their duty to protect their shareholder interests so it was an outside in uh risk analysis and you know, trillions of dollars have been invested. Uh, trillions of dollars have moved from traditional asset management strategies to quote unquote ESG asset management strategies. Um, billionaires have been created managing these assets. Um, and all of it was, uh, in a sense, confused, I think, some of the practitioners as well as the public that managing the 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 environmental risks and social and governance risks better as a company which would lead to better performance as a company somehow had something to do with solving the sustainability challenge and so double materiality is looking at the outside in risks but also looking at the risks that a individual company poses to the outside to society and to uh to the planet and so now that's progress. Um, and that's obviously where the rubber meets the road on sustainability. But there's a third piece, which we're still not 
largely having embedded in the conversation, which is the context. You know, what, what does it mean for, you know, pick your company of your choice, Visa, to have a, you know, impact of X, Y, Z on the climate or on society, you know, compared to what, relative to what, what is, what is the fair, what is the right share of, of climate, of CO2 emissions that Visa, for example, just to pick one company uh, that's appropriate for Visa. And, you know, after 25 years of the ESG industrial complex, we're still not even having that right question answered or asked. Is that fair? Sure. And again, if you if you come at this, well, you, hell, you're the master on this. If you come at this from what is regenerative capitalism, what are the principles of doing business in ways that are truly regenerative, then getting the ESG stuff right is easy. You're already doing it. ESG was a an effort to make up for the fact that companies aren't thinking regeneratively. They aren't doing business within the boundaries of nature's principles. And, and I said that this morning to this group who were throwing the term regenerative around. And I said, do you know what that means? Yeah, well, it's sustainability. No, it's not. Yeah. yeah. You really ought to go and read John Fullerton's paper, Regenerative Capitalism, before you use that term at all. And, oh, and they all wrote it down. So we'll see. You might have got Hunter, you're, you're, you continue to be my, my greatest cheerleader for my work. <laughs> but honestly, it's, it's um, it, it, you know, just to, we're digressing a bit, but this, this idea of regeneration is uh, obviously becoming popular. But as you just said, many people who use it um, do think of it as, as either an agriculture thing uh, or as the latest fashionable way to talk about sustainability. And, um, you know, my, my biggest frustration everywhere I go is, is that it takes time to really process what, what it means to think, you know, to think about an economy or an individual business operating in, a, in accordance with how life actually works. It's just profoundly different than uh, what we've been trained to think where we think of life and organizations as machines that are meant to be optimized. And so we're running around trying to optimize new new factors uh, as opposed to understanding that you can't optimize in living systems. Um, getting off track, so yeah. getting back to, to governance. So. You know the ESG conversation. Um, again, I I um, I have I have great respect for people that are working in the field and trying to move corporations toward uh, alignment with governance in accordance with non-financial metrics. Um, and yet, somehow we 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 we've invented an entire industry and a, and a way to, for people to make a living producing reports. And, and and collecting data that um, really has nothing to do with the hard decisions we need to make, which we don't need any data to make, which is we need to, you know, for starters, stop burning fossil fuels. And of course, we continue to burn more fossil fuels this year than we did last year. Because so we subsidize that to the tune of seven yeah, and we subsidize it. Yeah, even better. dollars a year. That's right. your and my tax dollars subsidizing the wrong thing. Right. Industrial agriculture, we subsidize it to the tune of a million dollars a minute. Fossil is, what is it, uh, $13 million a minute. This is globally? Yeah, going to the wrong thing. Right. And Which so, gets back to the political government. process being, yeah. So, so the what do we, answer so, to so that Hunter, is you have get, some, get you rid have, of I mean, the perverse subsidies. And again, yeah. we we know how to do that. And in the UN's new language is a call to begin to look at the perverse subsidies. So that's useful. This, but it's 2024, and, and we've known that for 25 years. And, yeah, this is the uh, pin from Kyoto, COP3. <laughs> We're now going into COP29. What? UN's been 30 yeah. years of COPs, and in that time, emissions have doubled. 
Yeah. And the next one is going to be where again? Azerbaijan. <laughs> Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan for our sins, a, uh, a nation with very deep human rights violations. I just received a uh, an email this morning. Do not go. It will not be safe. Like, yeah, well, I'm going. So, but why do, why do you go to these cops, Hunter? Seriously. There's several yeah. reasons. One is it's if you're in the climate space, it's the world's greatest party. It is the one or two times in the year that I see everybody who's working in this space. But that's a that's not a reason to burn the jet fuel to go. I can get on Zoom with these people. The real reason to go is Now Partners Future Economy Forum hosts dialogues where we pull together the negotiators, uh, corporates, NGOs, the youth who are there and talk deeply about what are the solutions and then how do you implement them regardless of the silliness that's going on in the negotiations where I kid you not, they argue over where to place the commas and brackets. We've hmm. negotiated everything that needs to be negotiated. Yeah, it's all pre-baked before they get there, right? All pre-baked. And then they barely agree to something like at, uh, what was it, uh, Sharm el Sheikh, they agreed to the loss and damage fund. $100 billion to help pay for the very real losses and damages in the majority of the world. And that $100 billion was what the nations are already paying for development. Nothing added. It's just a game. It's just a like, game. Yeah. And... So if you if you think anything useful is going to come out of the UN COP process, you're sadly mistaken. And it's designed that way. The uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, one of the Rio three conventions. There's one then on biodiversity, which will have its 16th COP in Cali in October. There's one on desertification, which will have its 16th COP in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia in December. Dan, yeah, I'll be there. The it was set up so that every nation has a veto. Saudi makes a billion dollars a day. Every day they delay action on climate change. Y'all yeah, really think they're going to do something? But we can do things. And so at, uh, at Sharm el-Sheikh, we got together with SECOM, the group that I put into the chat. This is... Um, Sorry, Hunter, we... before, before you tell that story, let me just go back to the... The fact that everyone, in, right up to the Secretary General, knows what you just shared, right? Yes. Yes. So why do they continue? Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm really serious. Like, it's, I'll, I'll it's, tell you why. The developing nations, the the negotiate, the so-called negotiators get paid a per diem of four hundred dollars a day. So they get to fly out of country. They get a visa to go to wherever it is. They get paid $400 a day, and many of them just go shopping. They love so the, going to the you're, cops. You're making me even more depressed. Yes, it <laughs> is. The, the why, cop, the why does cop the, structure. Gutierrez is a good man. He is. I, Kofi Annan was a good man. I, I used the word man twice. I don't believe there's yet been a good woman running the United Nations. We may get one. Mia but Motley why is, is apparently in the running. Oh, good. But if 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 the these are good people and they understand the charade, and it must cost someone told me it cost a billion dollars to run the last cop. Well, the Emirates have it. They put on the cop of all cops. So we just spent a billion dollars on a on a shopping party, knowing it wasn't going to happen. I mean, is this the best humanity can do? No, it is not. I just don't get it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to sound like a naive kid, but everyone takes this process as if it's the serious process where you're supposed to go and and yet it's 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 a complete joke and it's 30 years of proof that it's a complete joke. And and the Amazon is burning, the ice is melting and we don't have a better response. I just don't understand. And what what's someone like me supposed to do? Because I'm not gonna go to these. You really do want me to talk about it, don't you? Yeah. 
All right. Here we go. World premiere, folks. <laughs> I was I was asked uh, about two and a half years ago by a very senior UN official if I would help him build a global citizens movement to solve the climate crisis by enabling people everywhere to implement in their own communities the solutions that we know work, that we have, building a global platform for a conversation around what are these solutions, how do you do it with phone numbers? So if you want to see who's done it, you can call them up and say, how'd you do it? How'd it work? Or if it fails, you can put up, you know, I tried this. It didn't work for the following reasons. Can somebody help me? We can a, solve what, a big WhatsApp crisis. thread. A big WhatsApp thread replaces the United Nations. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Um, except that it would be a, a somewhat more sophisticated platform than WhatsApp. We've been offered a platform that was built in Germany on the cost of, I believe, uh, six to eight million dollars, and it doesn't have users. We said, We've got the users. This between this guy, me, all of you on this call, we have the global network. I have been building a list of everybody who knows about this and working with groups like Partners for Planetary Emergency out of Europe, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty people on the minute we launch this thing, and we may launch it at Baku because we know Baku will fail, the cops fail. They declare great success over things like the loss and damage fund, but that it's a failure. We It does nothing to address the root causes of the climate crisis, which are... Yeah, and the other thing is they, be, in the last minute, they weasel the language, you know, as if they think people aren't... No, I mean, it's like, what do they think? We're just stupid? It, it's just so um, infuriating. I mean, like, how do these people look at themselves in the mirror? I forget what the language was that the the sheik negotiated and stood up and everyone collapsed. See, it was to uh, phase out fossil in the in energy systems, which was code yeah. Yeah. for power plants. Now at Glasgow, yeah. they already agreed to phase out coal, and no oil much is used in power plants. So we're talking about a bit of gas, which is already being phased out. Because right. everywhere solar is cheaper than fossil, so yeah, it was a it was a mealy mouth, useless statement. He this from the same guy who earlier in the cops said there is no scientific evidence that we need to phase out fossil, and Mary Robinson, bless her, took him on. Yeah. Oh, the other cool thing about being here. And then, like and, then, and then he mansplained to her that we're, we're here to have a serious conversation. And she took him on and shut him down. And uh, 2,000 scientists signed a letter saying, yeah. no, Mary's right. Now, I got to meet and be with Stan Robinson, author of Ministry for the Future, which if you haven't read, go read Stan's book, Kim Stanley Robinson, Ministry for the Future. Big, thick book hard reading it does have a happy ending and it hmm. is mary robinson who is the minister of for the future hmm. which is pretty cool eh? yeah yeah but you know despite that the the mainstream media still didn't cover the the real story there's no headline failure exclamation point i'm, I'm running across the new york times and the washington post and where you know the Paris Le Mans. I mean, it's the the headline is success, and and a and a and a bunch of people clapping their hands. Yes, year. I don't on understand. Year on year on year, and we we all know the hollowness of that. One of the reasons that we are launching this massive citizens movement is globally representative surveys show that well north of eighty percent, in some cases eighty nine percent of people want aggressive climate action, know we're in a climate crisis and want to see something done, but way south of 40% think anybody else feels the same way, which is to say we all feel alone. 
Mm. And nobody's going to put their hand up if they're the only one. So we all sit here saying, but what can I do? I'm just one person. Yeah. You said 8 billion people. And as we bring people together and make visible what is happening in their communities, done by ordinary people, done by forward governments. You know, for years it was China was the bad guy. Well, we're not going to implement uh, energy efficiency or renewable energy because China's just going to keep burning coal. Last year, China implemented half of all solar that went in in the world. China that. is That's going stunning. to hit peak fossil emissions by 2030, if not earlier. Europe yeah. is headed that. for China peak has, emissions. China has put up half the solar panels on the planet. Yes. In China. In China. And that doesn't even count the wind. Why? Because right. they couldn't breathe. And right. because it's cheaper. Solar is everywhere cheaper than fossil. Ch so cheaper helps, you... but but you, you know I gave a talk at the at the um Club of Rome in Mexico. Do you remember what year that would have been? When he Fifteen, maybe fourteen. Anita, do you Probably remember? Probably there. Yeah. Twenty fifteen. I, I the issue. Twenty fifteen. Anita knows. Twenty fifteen. Anita was there. Yeah. So I raised the issue then that we're not even getting back to governance for a second. That we're not even yet having a conversation about what Saudi Arabia and Russia and Iraq and Iran and Mexico, and uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Alaska, um, Venezuela are supposed to do when we essentially require them to shut down the majority source of revenues for their economy. And you know it's it's really no different than asking Brazil not to cut down the Amazon. It's just that the Amazon is still standing, but for for Venezuela not to pump oil or for Saudi Arabia not to pump oil economically is is not that different than Brazil not cutting down the Amazon. And we're not even having the conversation about how we're going to mobilize the resources, the know-how to redevelop these entire economies so that those parts of the world don't implode if they are to stop, if they are to shut down their economies. And, and we still, in the global governance conversations I'm aware of, that conversation hasn't even started yet. In fact, we're, we're, we're just fighting with each other. So how will your new, um, and I know this is an unfair question, Hunter, but I'm curious, Let's say we we you're successful in this incredible citizen movement around the world, and we all have each other's WhatsApp phone number on a much better platform, and there's solar panels going up everywhere and rivers being restored everywhere and all this kind of good stuff. But Saudi Arabia's economy is still 80% revenues sourced from selling fossil fuels, and they'll have a revolution if they stop producing fossil fuels. Actually, How do we deal Saudi, with that government's challenge? Saudi is experimenting, and the Emirates are even further ahead, with massive deployment of solar, particularly, because you know people say we're going to be the Saudi Arabia of solar. Saudi said, excuse us, we're going to be the Saudi Arabia of solar, and then cable the power over. They're investigating a lot of other renewable options, so I wouldn't count them out. It's just that right now, it is so easy. You're saying them. that they'll be an exporter of, of electricity? I think they will be. It's so easy. Actually, you know, on, on that, just to to to, to share a positive uh, <clears throat> bit of news, I, I received a pitch the other day from a company that has developed some new kind of uh, electric wire that is, you know, 90% more efficient in transmitting electricity than copper and would you know would mean windmills can be a third the size and produce the same amount of energy and it would mean that Saudi Arabia could export electricity much farther than today's technology would allow so maybe that's not so far fetched 
The Saudis are also, and the oil companies are getting very serious about hydrogen. Now, I don't think that's the answer, but we do now produce a great deal of industrial hydrogen, steam reforming natural gas. And so if you can produce hydrogen in with solar, with wind, turn it to ammonia, tanker it around where you need it, turn it back to the hydrogen, this is th th this will take off more of the use of gas. And we are going to EVs. Uh, the work of Tony Seba, S-E-B-A, at Rethink X. Tony's basically said by 2030, 2035, it's all over but the shouting. We, we are electrifying everything. And as we do that, there goes Saudi's business model. They see this. Again, the Emirates are even further ahead. They understand they have a limited window to keep producing this stuff. And so they need to start investing in the alternatives. It's one of the reasons uh, Saudi is hosting the desertification COP. <laughs> they have a lot of sand. And if you get your mobility, best of all through <laughs> being where you want to be, next best of all through walking, biking, next best through good public transit. And you see, uh, they just announced a uh, high-speed train from Berlin to Paris. We're getting uh, long-distance high-speed trains in. Those are electric. Yeah, then, Boston, Boston to New York might be a good idea. <laughs> might be a good idea. Although <laughs> I did that trip uh, just the other day coming down here for Climate Week. The rail bed needs to be rebuilt. I know. But, the, I, can, uh, I can hear them working on it every night from my house, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, it's passed right by your house. I waved. Uh, <laughs> the when when you stop using the product, the market for selling it goes away. And we're very, very close. Study out of uh, Cal Berkeley, uh, Goldman School. By 2035, the U.S. could be 90% solar, wind, renewables, and save a trillion dollars a year by doing that. Mark yeah. Jacobson at Stanford has again and again and again shown we can power the entire world renewably. Uh, Christian Breyer in Europe has shown the same thing. So that's half the solution to the climate crisis profitably. The other half, of course, is regenerative agriculture. We know how to take 10 gigaton a year of carbon out of the air, put it in the soil just through regenerative grazing. Then add in what Rodale does with regenerative uh, vegetable growing. There's the other half of the solution. So yeah. what do but you it gets, do? It gets back to the governance question though. I mean, I, 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 I'm, does it? I'm fully, fully on board with that, but, but yeah, because the fastest way to transition to renewable energy and um, and regenerative agriculture would be to flip the subsidies out of the bad stuff and into the good stuff. And we, you know, we're, we are subsidizing the good stuff, but, um, but we are stuck because of our governance failure. And, uh, you know, it, not only are we not cutting the subsidies, we're not, you know, increasing the taxes on the bad stuff, which is what we should be doing. Uh, um, but but let me l let you finish your your um, your vision on this. Um, call it a bottoms up citizens movement to break the stranglehold of the failure of the United Nations. And I I think it's noteworthy to say that this includes some of the some people who are very senior in the United Nations who are uh, who are participating in this. So that to me is a very uh, hopeful sign um, because that that sends a signal if that happens. This, this is not my idea. Uh, honestly, I was going to hang up my spurs. Uh, two and a half years ago, I was going to quit. My husband's been after me to retire, stay home, ride my horse, watch an eagle fly. Other than the, the delight of talking to you right now, that sounds like a mighty attractive idea. I would love <laughs> to get the hell out of New York and go home and just stay there. And he pitched me on this idea, very senior UN official. And my first thought was, that would be enough. I've been asking myself, do you add up everything I've ever done? Is it enough? No, we're losing. 
Do I know what enough is? No. Then why burn jet fuel? Why go down the road? He pitched me on this idea. That would be enough. And so and then he looked at me and said, will you join me? Let's see. I promised my husband I was going to retire. And I looked at him and said, I will ride for your brand. And I said, you have no earthly idea what that means, but you'll figure it out. And what it means is I am all in. This is the rest of my life. I am committed to making this happen. And again, there is this vast network of people who know about this, who have said, I'm in. And it's happening. It's not a, if it happens, it's when do we choose to announce it? Because yeehaw. Nod your head, pull the gate. And, and, and last I checked, you could use $10 million to. Well, I need to build out the garage. Uh, 10, would be, 10 would be sweet. I need to build the global team. And, you know, all of us have been volunteering. We need to be able to pay people in on every continent, particularly in the majority of the world who can't afford to volunteer. And as, as soon as I get, I, I reckon I need 2 million a year. That will run this thing. And then what will happen in terms of governance when people realize that they can implement the solutions that by talking with their neighbors, by working together in their community, in their neighborhood, in their region, they can govern. Yeah. They can. No, it, I mean, it, as I shared, Hunter, it is completely aligned with what I see happening in the in the quote unquote regenerative <laughs> space. This, um, you know, the bioregional movement, um, you know, for healing landscapes is very much a a the same concept of of people feeling agency that they can actually impact um, in their own you know in their own place and and get super inspired and and energized around it i was i was just at a meeting on um friday last week um in greenwich connecticut of all places and um and we had a a collection of bioregional regenerators uh including um uh, several people from the local indigenous community and it was it was fascinating to see how the you know, the, all of us well-meaning non-Indigenous folks, um, uh, and, you know, we had our agenda and we had our work plan, and then uh, the elder that was there from the tribe started speaking, and the whole room just quieted down, and and the agenda went out the door, and everyone just started listening, and someone shared with me that this is a proverb in uh, Crazy Horse um uh there's a, i forget what it's called but there's a famous proverb which essentially says uh <clears throat> someday they will come back seeking our wisdom and um i i think this is you know your your vision is another example of shifting the the um the the power and of, of of the change from top down to um you know truly empowered participation to use one of the principles I like to talk about, which which is very different than, um, you know, than inclusiveness, right? This is not a charity thing, let's be inclusive. This is actually the way life works, is, is all participants in the life process participate, are empowered to participate in the process. So I, I do think your vision could hold great um, potential more for what is unpredictable than than my understanding and my analytical understanding of what it could achieve that is predictable. Um, so I'm I'm very hopeful for that and and find it very exciting. Um, I've done my I'm best sure... to embed your principles. Yeah, well, they're not mine. It's just an observation of how life works. Uh, well, concept... this is not my idea. Uh, this is all of us together. Yeah. But it is the only thing I have heard of that I think has the capacity to take on the scale of the climate challenge. And I said this yesterday to a senior UNFCCC official. I said, 
I'm not sure we need UNFCCC. He was whining about our budget is being cut. Yeah, your budget's being cut because you haven't done a goddamn thing. Hmm. Well, how about we take that budget and put it into enabling people everywhere to do this? There's a guy named Rich Wilson out of the UK who has Global Citizens Assembly. Why don't we have the UN by lottery? People apply to be UN representatives and are chosen by lottery from every country and then come together and make the decisions that are needed. That would be true multilateralism. And yeah. he's proposed it to Guterres, who likes the idea, and they're going to trial it. We should try it in the U.S. Congress. Now, there you go. <laughs>